Okay, I just uh, I just got a an, uh, an instant message from my my mother who's informing me that she was going on a trip or something. Wanted me to know wanted uh, me to know where she was going, and I said, okay, great, mom, it's great to hear from you. Listen, if you want to, um, uh, I'm in San Francisco. Uh, if you uh, if you want to watch my speech in a few minutes, you can just click here. And she said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, um, well, I'm giving a talk, and you can you can watch it. Right there, she said. But now, what channel is that again? <laughs> um, so it was great. I said the Mises Channel. You know, so, um, so she's. I, I hope she's watching. Actually, I can say it. Right, I can say hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, the conference is. Is I, I hope if all goes well, being being uh, broadcast all, all over the world, um, these kinds of things are just unimaginable. I guess I feel I feel like a kid sometimes uh, in in uh, dealing with all this technology stuff. Um, it, it's just every day it's a miracle, and uh, what we're doing with the website right now, uh, in in terms of delivering information, far surpasses anything I, I could have imagined happening uh, just a few years ago. Uh, in a sense, it makes our, our working for the Mises Institute every day uh, a new kind of experience. You know, I've had people ask me, you know, look, um, you've been working for the Institute since 1985. Uh, isn't this sort of unusual? Isn't a person supposed to change jobs from time to time, you know, in, in one's professional life? Um, well, it is like changing jobs, you know. Every day I get up and I think, where do I want to work? Where do I want to work today? Where do I most want to be employed? And the Mises Institute is every day. This, it's always the same answer. The Mises Institute is perfect, um, and uh, you know, not not only the colleagues, not only uh, the opportunity to promote and um, uh, and distribute uh, the ideas of, of the greatest thinkers of our time, of all time, but uh, with technology the way it is, uh, the job is endlessly changing. Um, so, I have the great pleasure of spending the next 20 minutes talking about uh, one of the things I love most in this world, and that is the Mises Institute website. Um, I was talking to a fellow the other day who, was, um, who actually assisted me over the summer with, uh, with uh, doing some massive upgrades. I don't know if you read the story. We wrote a, co-wrote a story about this. Uh, but we were, we were trying to think of what, what sites in the world uh, compare in terms of the size and uh, the, the, just the sheer amount of distribution of, of, of MP3s, of PDF files, of uh, just, just sheer, sheer downloads throughout the day. Um, and we thought of sites like, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, JSTOR for for academic purposes, these kinds of sites. This is, this is what Mesosaur compares to. These other sites have hundreds of employees. Um, we have just a few of us. It's, it's in, in a way, we've been, we've been very blessed and very lucky and, um, and benefited so immensely from, from technology. It's um, it's difficult to explain it all. I, I know there are probably some people here when I said the word MP3, you thought, what is he talking about? Actually, somebody came up and said, oh, so now we're going to get the big high-tech thing, you know, with the screen and the website. And Yeah, I guess so. I guess that's what we're going to get over the next, uh, next few minutes here. Um, I mean, quite simply put, what we have with Mises Org, to my mind, is the, uh, the greatest example of the unity of technology and truth anywhere in the world. It does uh, uh, precisely what the enemy fears the most. It provides instantaneous access to the whole world of scholarship and the defense of freedom, a tradition of thought that the state and its affiliated institutions have been trying to suppress for centuries. And so compelling is this tradition and so strong is this persuasive power that it works on its own to draw and maintain interest and adherence. Uh, just yesterday... Um, uh, Jim Zostrowski posted on the blog some uh, happy birthday greetings to Lou Rockwell and uh, you're welcome to read the thread that's developed as a result of that posting uh, last I checked there were 50 some odd posts of people talking about what uh, Mises Org and Lou's own personal site has meant in their own intellectual development and it would be very difficult uh, there's nothing I could say that can compare to what you can read right now just what people have posted from 5 a.m. this morning uh, up until just now. It's remarkable. Um, in so many ways, the site is changing the world. 
Um, but let me begin by announcing, and I say this to today, a new addition to, to Mises Org uh, that to me somehow uh, captures the marvelous power of this technology to do things that no one would have imagined only a few years ago to say nothing about all of human history. And I'm going to do something very dangerous. I'm going to click on that button and we're going to see if it works. Very nice. Okay. Uh, the story of the newest addition to the site begins in March 1934 when Mises received a letter from the Institute of Higher International Studies in Geneva asking him to be a visiting professor. Accepting this position would entail uh, a big pay cut, pay cut and leaving his beloved Vienna, but uh, the offer also meant security and relief from his growing disgust at Austrian politics and the rise of um, a, a great menace just outside his, his door, the, uh, the uh, National, German, National Social, Social German Workers' Party as an adjunct to Hitler's growing power, power in Germany, who was rising there in Austria and he knew he would be personally threatened. Uh, but he also knew that from Geneva he could, uh, he could think and he could write and he could even travel as time allowed. It was an ideal setting with constant seminars and a good library and a cordial environment and, and he went there and he found wonderful opportunities. Uh, there were six staff, 12 faculty and 100 students of whom half were working towards their PhD. And uh, as I read that, that sentence, does that remind you of any other setting that you might know of? Uh, Mises. Mises University, yeah. Six staff, 12 faculty, 100 students. It's about right. Yeah. Um, Guido Holzman's forthcoming biography of Mises contains many wonderful details of this period of Mises' life. Uh, I could spend the next 20 minutes just talking about that. I've, I have the privilege of having read it in draft form. But uh, let me just raise the point that's relevant for this talk. Mises was working on a book during these years, a very large book. It would be a synthesis of all of his previous work on money and banking, the methodology of the social sciences, business cycles, political economy and socialism, and his studies of war and collectivism. Everything would be combined, and he would add additional theoretical details on production and development and interest rates, value theory and history, and a range of other fields. And most importantly, he would attempt to tie it all together in a unified system of economic thought, one large enough to stand next to the great classical treatments but surpass them in scientific rigor. This book would seek to construct an entire intellectual system in opposition to nearly all the trends of, of his time and ours. It would employ deductive methods in the social sciences when positivism was on the march. It would reject mechanical analogies in economic science and focus instead on human choice. It would advocate laissez-faire, not just in trade but in all areas of political economy including money and banking. And this would be the book that would come to be National Economy. Forgive my journal, German. And he would work six years on it. Six years. Um, but as he worked, he could not neglect to see what was happening outside his window. Uh, Europe was going to be torn apart by war again. Second time in his lifetime. He was observing the rise of two competing forms of socialism. Competing the speed at which they could smash civilization and the rise of Keynesianism in the US which he uh, recognized as uh, just a very cranky form of economics that had long been overthrown. When the war came in 1939 he was probably examining the page proofs of his book and he must have had a great sense of foreboding even now and the book appeared in 1940 a treatise on economics written in German, published in Geneva, and appearing in wartime. And you can guess what happened. It was a disaster. The book went nowhere. It sank almost without a trace. And even worse, Mises was just then being pressured to leave for the U.S. It wasn't sure at all that he would be safe in Geneva. Now keep in mind, he was 60 years old. 60 years old at this time. This is supposed to be, things are supposed to be secure for a man like Mises. 
he was asked to be and start a new life and a new career. Uh, he would have to become proficient in a new language. His French was very good. Uh, his English was less so. And it was during this period that he wrote his darkest thoughts about how he started off as a reformer and only ended up as a, a historian of decline. <coughs> now, after he came to the U.S., this great book, Nuts in All Economy, would, would end up being rewritten in English and published as Human Action nine years later. Uh, and when you dig through the archives, of the letters back and forth, it's striking to see how... Uh, how close this book came to not being, being published at all. The publisher didn't really want to publish a book of this length. Professional economists wouldn't write in support of its publication. Uh, he had a friend at Yale University Press who you know, talked to some of his former colleagues, some of whom wouldn't even support the publication of this book because they said there was nothing new in it. And it was thanks to Fritz Machlup and uh, Henry Hazlitt at the New York Times that finally the Yale University ended up publishing the thing. Um, Anyway, Human Action was a work of genius. It came out in 1949. It's been a bestseller ever since. Uh, but what disappeared from, from history was this 1940 book. Um, and I'm not sure why. Of course, we have Human Action now. Um, but to me, there's something very, very special about being able to um, give you this 1940 predecessor. Thanks to Firefox, we get a pretty good... There it is. There's the book. That's the one that sank without a trace. The whole treatise is right here for anyone in the world to download and look at. Um, it's completely scannable. Um, it's very fast. This is one of something on the order of 100, 150 books or so that we have on the website. Um, this is scanned in by our dear friend George Reisman. Um, and it took just a few moments to upload it and make it live and active. Now, can you imagine such a thing? You know, to the young people here, you think, well, that's just the way the world works. <laughs> <laughs> but to guys my age, this is amazing. And it's just one of many amazing things on the site. Um, we also offer uh, our own scholars' edition completely free that's the book we published a few years ago um, I've written quite a lot of, in support of the idea of online books you know people say why would you put a book online when you're also selling it uh, well the answer the first answer to that is that's our job that's what we're here for we're, we're here to get the ideas out there that's the job of the Mises Institute and it would be absurd for us to, if we have the technology we have the server space we have the ability to pull it off um, we should get the truth out there. That's what the whole site is dedicated to doing. It just so happens that having books online actually increases sales. Um, omnipotent government, we put online, you know, the great book. It was a, it's a great book. We put it online um, about four months ago. We hadn't sold any copies of that thing in years, and suddenly hundreds were flying out the door as soon as we put it online. You know, and we had to persuade, the, as a matter of fact, we had to pay a lease to the publisher to put it online. Uh, and he said that the purpose of the lease was to reimburse him for all the lost sales. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I've, I've been urged to contact him again and ask uh, him to reimburse us, but we'll just, you know, <laughs> not, not do that. Yeah. Um, now, I'm old enough to remember a time when in order to get a book or an article in the hands of another person, you had to hand deliver it. You had to give it to them or rely on the government to get it there for you. Uh, this, as far as I can tell, uh, in my, endless, my, my massive research, this situation lasted from the ancient world until the fax machine of the 1980s and finally the invention of the web browser in the mid-1990s. That's how quickly everything has changed for us. Uh, communication technology has, has, has meant so much for us. Uh, for a marginal radical intellectual movement like, like ours, um, it, it means that students can, for the first time, discover that we exist. When I was an undergraduate, um, I had a professor warn me not to read Mises. So uh, what's the first thing that a person does? You know, you go to uh, That was great advertising. Um, and and uh, I had read many works of, of Mises at the time. I, I didn't know there was a Mises Institute. You know, who knew? 
1985, I happened to be walking down Massachusetts Avenue and looked up and saw a, a, a brass sign, a gleaming <coughs> brass plaque on a building that said the Mises Institute. And I, I'll never forget this moment. I mean, you can imagine... It's, it's an, it was an amazing thing. An institute devoted to the thought of Mises, <laughs> the unity of radical laissez-faire politics and economic science all coming together to oppose every trend of our time, to you know bring about a free world. Um, I, I couldn't imagine such a thing. It was it was thrilling. My, I mean, my heart just jumped, you know. And I remember going in and having my first conversation with Lou Rockwell at the time, and uh, uh, things went well. And, but um, but now look at it. I mean, I had to be walking along the street to see this thing. You could, of course, look in per- per- Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. How many remember doing this? You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So those days are gone. Now all you have to do is uh, type the word Mises into into Google, and you 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 get this amazing world of information. We have. Um, I'm not going to have time to take you through it, but we have uh, um, a, a, a good friend of ours. Um, keeps track of how many audio files we have uh, going up there. And uh, I asked him this morning, I said, did you say we have 100 or 150 hours? And he said, uh, of audio files up there. He said, no, no, 250 audio, uh, hours of audio files we have up here. And it just occurred to me, that's as much as the average Frenchman works in a year. It's <laughs> amazing. Uh, I mean, most... Tenured professors don't lecture that much in a lifetime, you know. I mean, it's, it's an enormous amount of material. Um, uh, I've, I've mentioned this in the past, this, this left and right over here you see in the bottom. You know, Murray, Murray put out this journal back in the, uh, in the 60s, uh, just seeing a few friends and distributing it only to those people who are very interested. You know, it came out three years, brilliant stuff, but when it stopped coming out, you know, you figure that's the end of it, right? That's the end of the journal. It was fun while it lasted. And, well, uh, you know, Murray died before knowing that his journal would be resurrected. And it's now there for the world to see. It's linked uh, websites all over the place. Um, Mises Institute, Mises Org has, has uh, thousands of links coming into it um, from student sites, from professional sites, from professors' classrooms all over the world. And I keep saying all over the world, it's very important to remember that the Austrian school isn't just an American school. It is an international school. Uh, Jeffrey Herbin, a few years ago, mentioned at the Austrian Scholars Conference that the, the Austrian school is the closest uh, thing we have to matching the, the power that Marxism had in the 19th century, in the late 19th century. It's a, truly an international school, and it's been the website that's, been, that's made this possible for us. Um, This, this uh, blog itself is uh, one of the most trafficked areas of the site. I'm not going to take you through it. Uh, let me just mention a few other things that, that uh, we're very excited about. Man, Economy, and State is also online. Um, I'm going to do another dangerous thing. I'm going to click on the link that says entire text in PDF just to show you how fast the site is going. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Okay, there you go. 1,500-page book comes up like that. That's great. Um, yeah, very, it's very nice. Uh, we've got Ethics of Liberty up there. Within the next month, we'll have Menger's Principles, Principles of Economics. Menger, his Principles of Economics is going online, and in PDF and in text and every other kind of thing. You know what? I'm going to stop right there, although I could talk about this all day, because I, ever since I got to this conference, I've been hit with a ton of questions about the site, and you might have a few, and I'd like to answer them. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead. Yeah. What's it costing us every month? Yeah, this is an interesting. What does it cost? Um, there was a time when everybody thought that if if you linked into a site, that was good for the site. Not necessarily. It costs money to to deliver this amount of material. Um, uh, until about uh, six months ago, it was it was hurting us very badly actually to run this 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 site because uh, it was very expensive. But we did some shopping around and discovered that brand with bandwidth prices had plummeted in the meantime and we did some, some little competitive work and, and dropped our costs down to just a, a small fraction of what they were uh, uh, a few months before. That was, that was great fun, I tell you. To be able to go to our current provider and say, 
You know, you can go ahead and turn off the server. We've moved. We found we found the same service for for, for virtually nothing. You know, so um, we're, we're, it was great. So we're doing. It's not the big cost. The big cost is time. And uh, and let me let me just say this. People always ask, how is it possible that this, that this kind of site could be put together by this kind of organization? As I say, a site that compares to JSTOR or the Wall Street Journal. How, how do you do it? How is it possible that this could happen with only a handful of, of employees? Uh, and, no, no, and none of us are totally devoted to the site. I mean, all of us have other things to do in life. And I, I, the answer is that we're all just fanatics. I mean, that is the answer. Uh, uh, you know, the title of this conference is Radical Scholarship. We're radicals. We're crazy for what we do. We love the ideas. And we, there's nothing we'd rather do. So we work on it just constantly. And uh, we're totally dedicated to getting the ideas out there. And uh, it's wonderful when you can love your work and do so much good at the same time. Another question? Anybody else? Yes. I've been saving a complete collection of the Journal of Libertarian Studies from issue one, planning to sell it and finance my retirement. And <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do? With it? <laughs> you can donate it to our library. How about that? Yeah. No, it's still valuable. This hard copy is still a wonderful thing. You know, it's it's a kind of a myth that somehow. Uh, books that, that these are replacements for each other, hard copy and, and web copy, they go together. You know, when you get a book, you buy a book, you, you're reading it, it, it's wonderful to be able to go online and find the same thing. You can search it, you can copy and paste it into an email and quote it, it's very important. You can, you can cite it this way, you can continue to reference back to it. You can read something online and say, well, this is getting tedious, I hit the screen. And, and, and go and pull out the book. And You know, they work together. The value of a book is enhanced by having the same thing online. Uh, we've gone to enormous effort. Oh, listen, I have to show you one other thing. I know Mark is going to be leaning on me about, about time. Um, but, and again, I'm going to take a big risk here because, not, you know, uh, not everything is, is supposed to work this well. Um, okay, Joe mentioned, um, what was the book you mentioned, Joe? Where is Joe? The Tussig's Tariff History, right? Okay, so I'm going to click on the word Tussig. What do we have here? Tariff history of the United States. Look at that. Yeah. Now, this, and let me tell you, this, this book, you can, you can go through Book Finder and get old dumpy copies. It's not in print anymore. You can get a cheap old paperback with you know, crazy print or whatever. Yeah. Look, this, this is a flawless edition. And uh, this isn't just a graphic scan. This is, oh, look at that. This is, this is, we reset this book completely. We scanned every word of it and reset it into, into a, a basic word processing program, your word, and, uh, and li linked, linked the whole thing up and printed it to PDF and uploaded it on the site. It's, um, it's 271 pages. There, there's no better edition of this anywhere that you can get in print that compares to this thing. It's a wonderful book, and it's brought back to life completely as a result of having been online. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? And I think my time is up. Uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Where are you going from here? Oh, wonderful. Um, <laughs> a shill. Yeah, a shill. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, look at all these jokes I passed up here. Ah. The future. Oh, this is a section called the future. Okay, mass media. Obviously, we're going to do more of what we're doing right now uh, with, this, with audio and video. Um, very excited about this. We have converted about a third of the site into .NET. I say we. David Vexler is listening and laughing. We have converted um, uh, a third of the site to .NET, uh, which reduced the load in enormously, which is the newest technology. We want to complete that conversion starting in January, I hope, and we're going to be working from January to August to totally revamp the thing. It's hard f uh, for you to imagine. This, this site has not had a broken link or no, no pattern of broken links, I should probably say, since, um, since we first made our conversion to .ASP, which was in something like 1997. This is unprecedented. I mean, no site is this old and yet works this well. You know, a lot of institutions dump a million dollars on some, you know, uh, set of geeks to, revi you know, to revamp the whole site and, and chuck their old, the old thing away. We never did that. We always believed that you should keep a link active, you know. So we've been 
constantly refurbishing it. You can imagine, a, 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 it's like a house built two centuries ago that you're continually adding to. You know, that's what Mesosorg really is. So anyway, we've converted a, a, about a third of it to .NET. We want to do the whole thing to reduce the load, to increase the delivery. Um, so we want, we want better delivery and um, better expertise. There's, there's all sorts of things that I would like to do on a daily basis we haven't been able to do. The commercial end of the site, the uh, catalog is a little bit weak right now. I mean, it, it works fine for us, but there's a lot a lot more than we could be doing. Um, uh, more interactivity. Um, there's an unlimited number of books that we can get online. You know, uh, I have a stack this high that we're working on. We just want to make sure that, that they're all perfect. You know, so it takes, it takes a lot of time. Yes, go ahead. To calibrate where we're going from here, is it fair to say that you have hundreds of books now available? I think so, online? yeah. And how long will it take to double that number? Well, it depends. Uh, gosh, I can't, I can't give any clear answers, can I? What's, what's it? Um, it depends on it depends on on what format they're going to take. Actually, um, some books you can scan and get right up. Um, other books take a lot more time. That Tausig book took a very long time because it was just a, a, a bear. Other books you can scan and just throw them right up. If you want to do things uh, like we've done, Man Economy and State, and like we're going to do Menger, you provide text, PDF, complete searchability, or or or, or fun fun things like. Um, uh, 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 on, on human action, we have a, uh, a fully interactive. Got to fix the margin. Sorry, a fully interactive index. Yeah, that's that's neat. So uh, let's go to bureaucratic management. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so things like this, the little tricks like this, take a long time, a lot longer. Um, so it really depends on the product that we're doing, and. Um, this this is this is one of the things. This, this took a few months. Actually, it took far less time than I ever imagined. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say on this on this man economy and state. This is really exciting. This is an example of what we're going to do for the future. Uh, part of the difficulty of this book, as you know, is that it's very very long and somewhat intimidating. Um, Robert Murphy is an economist at uh, Hillsdale is working right now on a wonderful study guide. And I, this thing is really great. It's, it's, a, it's a study guide to man economy and state. It's going to be about 150 pages. So it's like four or five pages per chapter. And he summarizes all the important points, directs you to uh, the key things in the chapter, and helps, helps guide you through the thing. Um, starting Monday, I'm going to put these things up chapter by chapter here. So you can go to this, you can read the book, or you can go through the guide. And I hope also to be able to make the study guide interactive with our with our with our quiz software. Um, I'm sure you've all taken the quiz. <laughs> yeah, um, this is our, we've got a little a nice little quiz program, so we can write quiz and generate you know tests for people as they're going through Manicomi. So anything to make it easier to read. Uh, we've all been convinced for some time that that if everybody could would just have the patience to sit down and read this amazing book, Manicomi State, and then also read Human Action, that um, it would make the world a much better place. And so that's, we're looking for any tool to do that, and that's one of them. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what about track rankings? I haven't seen track rankings. Oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, by traffic rankings, Alexa is what everybody uses. It's okay. I know there's plenty of problems with Alexa, but um, there, is, there is no larger institutional site dealing with economics anywhere in the world in terms of traffic. It's the largest. It's the best. I mean, it's the, it's, it, it delivers the most of anybody else, of any institutional sites dealing with economics. And as far as I can tell, the Mises Institute has the uh, highest um, Alexa rating of any um, policy-oriented nonprofit in the country, left, right, or center, as far as I can tell. I, I've, I've yet to see... Um, here's Hans's essay. Look at that. Also available in P PDF if you want to read that today. About Economist magazine. Economist magazine is bigger, but I don't consider that institutional, and it's not certainly not nonprofit. So we're not a, we're not a commercial uh, commercial operation. But so our, our rankings are working at about six thousand, something like that, which is very high. I could give you some comparisons, but I don't want to seem petty. But uh, <laughs> we beat our competitors. I'll just put it that way. Okay, I really need to stop. Thank you so much. <laughs>